Well, we've got um, two um, well-known speakers with us today, and I'm going to hand over to them pretty swiftly, especially because I'm pretty darn sure it will lead to a great conversation. Casper and Michael need very little introduction, um, and I have to say I cannot wait to hear from um, Michael Blount and Casper Kaiser on uh, whether we can trust subjective well-being scales uh, and the issues of comparability, linearity, and neutrality, something that the two of them have been thinking about for quite a while. Thank you. Over to you, Casper. Yeah, thank you, Jan, and, and thanks for having us. Um, and thank you all for coming and hopefully giving us plenty of, of feedback because what I'm going to present to you alongside Michael are currently results from a small scale pilot um, where we essentially ask all the kinds of questions that we want to ask people about comparable comparability, linearity, and neutrality. And now we are sort of at an impasse thinking about whether those really are the right kinds of questions to be asking um, and whether the kind of evidence that would be generated from a large scale version of the survey would in fact be uh, persuasive, not to you in particular, but whether you would expect these kinds of, of data to be persuasive to a skeptic. And I think that's, that's the most important thing that we ought to be working on. Um, so what we did do in this survey essentially is, is try and test for these, these three aspects that we think are key to making uh, well-being data useful for policy and business, et cetera. And that is, and probably from either speaking to Michael or me, um, you, you will have heard us talking about this to, to quite some extent. So those are the three things. So comparability is just the notion, okay, is it in fact the case that, you know, on a, on a question, let's say a life satisfaction question, whether a particular response option does in fact mean the same thing between two, two individuals? So is my six out of 10 the same as your six out of 10? Linearity then is, is the notion that, you know, differences between response options are, are, uh, can be interpreted as equally large. So that, you know, going from a four out of 10 to a five out of 10, as it carries the same distance in terms of underlying well being as going from, for example, a seven out of 10 to an eight out of 10. And so those two kinds of problems, I think, are, are reasonably well known in the literature. Whereas the, the third problem, I think, is less talked about. But as we are moving more and more towards using, you know, the well being adjusted life here, the well be, I think this will become a very important problem. And that is the problem of neutrality. In particular, the problem of neutrality is that we don't currently know where we should be indifferent, normatively speaking, between a person's existence and non existence. And unfortunately, only if we do know that point, which is not only an empirical question, but also a normative question. And so Michael will tackle that part of the of the presentation without knowing that that point we can't make actually any trade-offs between the quantity and the quality of life and so we need to have at least some evidence on this point of neutrality okay so what we do in this in this survey or in this in this pilot in particular is essentially we asked 50, roughly 50 questions um, on on comparability neutrality and linearity um, so far we fielded that survey to uh, only 128 participants. That's the, that's the amount of money that we had available up to this point. We're currently seeking funding. So if you know of funding sources, do let us know. And the, the focus in this, in this presentation is mainly showing that you know, this kind of thing is in fact feasible alongside some, some initial results. Um, and what we're particularly interested in is sort of what I said at the start, you know, your feedback and thinking about whether this would possibly convince a skeptic. Now, rushing through these slides, I realized that I didn't actually say uh, who is on that paper, and I really should have done that at the start. So this is not only the work from, from, from Michael and myself, actually, it's also the work of, of, of Sam Dupre, who, who works at the, at the Happy Lives Institute, and Conrad Samuelson, who was um, a summer intern at the Happy Lives Institute, and many of the implementation and the data analysis that was done so far uh, were actually by, done by, by, by those two. So, so I should get 
give much more credit to them than I did uh, at the start. Um, okay. Uh, and our plan is to eventually field this, this survey to uh, roughly 1,000 plus participants in at least two countries, one of which should better be a, a low and middle income country and one should be a richer country such that we can make a comparison uh, whether this kind of life satisfaction data that most of us are primarily interested in um, is actually comparable and linear in its answers across countries and comparable also in that sense. Okay. Just to show um, the kind of data that we got already from those, uh, this fairly small sample, you will see the kind of distribution on a life satisfaction question. So this is the standard, you know, taking all things together, how satisfied are you with your life these days question. We get the kind of distribution that you would expect. So it seems like, you know, data from Qualtrics reproduces, um, or data from Prolific, uh, roughly reprodu reproduces the kind of, of distributions of life satisfaction uh, that we normally see in this kind of data, uh, in this case, from the UK. Okay. So, so what are the kinds of questions that, that we've asked? So what you see here, each row is a, is a question type. And then in the columns, uh, we indicate um, to, to which kind of problem these, these question types can give evidence to. So, of course, we asked at the very start a life satisfaction question, uh, the standard one, and then we have a couple of, 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 of types of questions. So, the first one is that we ask um, a bunch of vignettes. I will explain in a second what these vignettes are. Uh, we, we feel two types of vignettes, one uh, taken pretty much directly from a recent paper by Montgomery, which is also implemented as part of the uh, Gallup World Poll. Uh, and then we compare these vignettes to vignettes that we've designed on our own, which we believe are actually better suited for the purpose of, of establishing comparability. Then what we also do is we field a set of questions that um, might be called psychophysical uh, calibration questions. And that's really in, inspired by a, a recent and really rather impressive paper by uh, Dan Benjamin and colleagues, um, where essentially you know, a sort of objective kind of stimulus is given to respondents, and then they have to rate the stimulus on a on a 10 point scale in our case, I would show some more detail later. On. What we also show is a, a set of what we said call objective subjective questions, and this is really inspired by a fairly well known paper by by Andrew Andrew Oswald, um, where we essentially ask individuals about cardinal quantities. Uh, ask them to rate these cardinal quantities on a 10 point scale, and then ask them to, to give the actual quantity uh, uh, as, it, as it occurs in nature. So we, here we ask about you know, people's height, we ask about uh, the number of friends that they have, and we ask about their income. This will become slightly clearer uh, in a couple of slides. We also ask about this neutral point. We literally ask people, you know, what's the point where you're you know, indifferent between uh, life and death. I mean, we don't do that literally, but but roughly that's what we do. Michael will say more about this. And then two more things that are substantive notes, what we do in order to establish comparability in particular, we just ask respondents what they mean with certain endpoints of the scale. Like what does it qualitatively mean for you to be a 10 out of 10 or a zero out of 10? And then the uh, final uh, kind of substantive question that I will be talking about today, ignore the, the final line, um, is that we literally ask respondents about their scale use and how they're um, uh, uh, using, you know, a response scale that might be given to them. This will also become clear in a second. So that's the, that's the quick overview. Okay, let me just um, run through some of the ideas underlying, you know, our test of, of comparability. So just briefly again, uh, what does comparability mean? Well, what you see on this picture here is uh, a case in which comparability would not hold. So, you know, on this on this horizontal axis, you know, we see latent underlying subjective well-being, and then uh, we've indicated, you know, two respondents, two potential respondents, Peter and Anna. And what we see is that, you know, where Anna would would let's say say zero out of ten. Peter would say a, sheer, say a fairly high number. And so in that case, you know, although these two scales do overlap, 
Peter and Anna don't in fact mean the same thing when they use a particular response option. So they adopt different endpoints uh, and each of the points in between are also different in meaning between the two individuals. And of course, there's been some literature on this um, previously, and those, this kind of literature um, can roughly be divided into two kinds of literatures. So the first one really focuses on scale use and subjective well-being scales. So there we have this vignette literature where, where um, you know, short description of fictional persons are given. Then there's some, been some work, Mark Fabian and I have both a paper on using memories in order to establish comparability. And so this kind of literature primarily focuses on comparability uh, in, in scale use for subjective well-being data in particular. There's also been this other literature that sort of is interested in, gen in general scale use. So in psychology, you have this literature on response styles. Uh, Andrew Oswald's uh, paper, with this object, what we call the objective subjective method, might be framed in terms of you know, differences in general scale use. And the recent paper by Benjamin et al. is also in that kind of, of tradition. OK. And what we do in general, or what this literature does in general, is essentially estimate a bunch of ordered probit models. So many of you will be roughly familiar with ordered probit models where you say, oh, OK, can you see my cursor? I hope you can see my cursor. Oh, there's um, uh, you know, a, a level of underlying latent well-being, WI, which is you know, given by a set of co uh, or determined by a set of covariates with associated co coefficients. And then respondents you know, choose some particular response category when they you know, cross a, a set of thresholds. And you know, what most of the people in this literature do, um, including me, is most of the time, is to assume that these, that these uh, thresholds are common across respondents. But of course, we can relax that assumption. And once we relax that assumption, uh, we allow for differences in scale use. So relaxing this assumption essentially means you know, to have a parameter uh, associated that varies with, you know, a set of covariates that, uh, that sort of determines the position of these thresholds. But as is well known, uh, this kind of, of, of model isn't actually identified when we only have uh, self-reported data on well-being. We actually need some set of additional stimuli. And the kinds of questions that we are asking in our survey try to provide these additional stimuli. And in order to make this work, we essentially need two kinds of assumptions. The first kind of assumption is that these stimuli uh, need to be answered on a scale that makes use of at least a positive monotonic uh, linear transformation of the original thresholds. Read this as you know, the same thresholds. That's the first assumption. So you know, the other stimuli must be answered on, um, on the same kind of scale. And we need this assumption that, these, that the underlying level of or perceived level of that stimuli is actually independent of the covariates that we're interested in. So this is what this assumption down here says. We can, we can you know, look at, this, at these equations in some more detail. Substantively, what it says is, okay, these stimuli need to exist on the same sort of, or be answered on the same sort of scale, and they need to be uncorrelated with you know, the kinds of covariates that we would be interested in a standard well-being analysis. And a bunch of the kinds of questions that we, that we did ask in the pilot do in, in fact this. So the vignette kind of questions do this, the psychophysical calibration questions that we have do this, the objective subjective method can be used for this purpose, and also the neutral point questions can be used for this purpose. I will not show any results on the objective subjective method and the neutral point question just simply in virtue of running out of time. I'm sure I'm already kind of running out of time and, and Michael is getting is starting to become nervous. So let me just give two examples uh, of what we did in the vignette case and in the case of, of the psychophysical calibration questions. So in the vignette case, what's typically done is to give a description of these fictional people where the focus really is on, on kind of objective markers of a person's life. So, you know, uh, in this case, you know, a, a uh, it's, the focus is on that on this person's uh, disposable income um, and her 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 general health status, and it's a fairly short vignette. And what we thought to do is actually when we want to establish the comparability of these you know 
uh, data on a person's feelings, then these vignettes should really also focus on those on those kinds of feelings. So the, the kinds of vignettes that we wrote, we wrote a bunch of them, really focus on the kinds of feelings that that people has have. Um, so we're, we're saying, you know, Christina here is generally happy, though she is disappointed with some aspects of her of her life. She finds some of her work meaningless. Um, she finds, you know, dating exciting and so on. Uh, so we try to focus on these kinds of feelings um, in comparison to these kind of more objective types of vignettes that are normally used in the, uh, in the literature. And just looking at, you know, some initial results, uh, what this shows us here is, you know, what, what we gave is are two uh, sort of three different kinds of vignettes, vignettes that, you know, either are meant to indicate a very high level of of uh, well-being of the described person, one with a medium level of well-being and one with a low level of well-being. And that also mirrors the kind of, of, of vignettes that, that exist in the Montgomery data. And just one useful thing maybe, uh, or that's indicative of the, of the better performance of our kinds of vignettes is, are, are two things. The first one is that, in fact, our vignettes are more spread out across respondents. So these means for e these reported means for each of these of these vignettes are further spaced out from one another than in the Montgomery case. And another thing that that we think speaks to the, the better important or performance of these vignettes is that in fact no none of our respondents sort of get the ranking of vignettes wrong. So they all say okay the vignette which we intended to have a higher life satisfaction was also rated as having a higher life satisfaction than the one we intended to be in the middle or that we intended towards the, the, the low end. Whereas this wasn't the case in the case of the Montgomery vignettes, where some of the respondents you know, dis disagreed with the intended ranking of the levels of life satisfaction, which already is indicative of the idea that respondents didn't in fact perceive these, these vignettes that were used by, by Montgomery as, as equal. Okay. Um, one one further you know snippet of of, of results is that in fact um, the the answers to these vignette questions so how people rated the life satisfaction of these of these uh, fictional people was largely uncorrelated with the life satisfaction of 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 the respondents themselves and we take this as some initial evidence in favor of comparability because what we would expect is that you know, a respondent's own life satisfaction should be correlated with their, uh, with the ratings they give to the vignettes if, you know, comparability were violated. And we don't, in fact, see that. So let me just quickly um, go to the second method that we're looking at in the, in the comparability case, and which is, which is uh, are these psychophysical calibration questions. And these are really inspired by Benjamin and Al. And essentially what we do here is we ask respondents to rate uh, these, these objective cardinal quantities. So we have three of these types. We have the obtuseness of an angle. We have the darkness of the circle. And we have the degree to which a, a square is filled with triangles. So what we give respondents are, you know, different pictures where this, this angle is, you know, sh more shallow or wider and ask then respondents the degree to which this angle is, is, is shallow or wide. It's the obtuseness of this angle. Or we give respondents a set of these circles, some are darker, some are brighter, and we ask respondents to uh, rate the, the brightness, again, on a zero to 10 scale uh, of these circles. And the same kind of idea with the degree to which this square is filled with triangles. Like how filled up is this, is this square? And then we get these, these kinds of, of results. Here again, the stimulus rank is, you know, we, we have in this case, uh, three conditions. For example, in the circle darkness case, you know, high would here mean that it's a particularly dark circle, whereas low would mean that it's a particularly bright circle. Uh, and then we show, we sh here show uh, the mean responses and the distribution of responses for each kind of these, of these stimuli. And again, we, we, we roughly see, which speaks to the feasibility of this method, that uh, these means and distributions are roughly spaced out in the manner that we would, that we would expect. 
And again, respondents' own life satisfaction is in fact uncorrelated or roughly uncorrelated with the kinds of answers individuals give to these, these, these types of questions. So what that again speaks to is that it seems like um, there's no general scale use tendency uh, that would explain any differences in, in the kinds of responses individuals give uh, on life satisfaction questions. So, so, so that again is you know, initial evidence from this very small pilot in favor of comparability. Um, we, we did similar kinds of, of, or we can run similar kinds of analysis again with the objective subjective method, as well as um, with the neutrality questions, but I'm just going to skip this for now uh, for time reasons. I want to give plenty of time to Michael and just want to point at this, at this final thing uh, where we ask respondents just, you know, to rate, uh, to, to state what kind of endpoints that they used when, when answering life satisfaction questions. So, so what, essentially what we did is we, we, had, we said to respondents, hey, earlier you indicated your level of life satisfaction on a zero to 10 scale. Uh, do you think of a score of 10 out of 10? And we did the, the inverse of this with a zero out of 10. And then we gave respondents a set of options, you know, the most satisfied that any human could possibly be, the most satisfied anyone is or ever was, the most satisfied that anyone you know has ever been, and so on. Uh, and we did the same thing with the zero out of 10. And it turns out that most individuals are kind of symmetric with respect to the endpoints that they give. Um, so uh, what they say on a, about 10 out of 10, you know, the, for example, they might select the most slash least satisfied that any human could possibly be. When they do select this for the top endpoint, they, they select rough, I mean, in almost all cases, the same thing also for the zero out of 10 endpoint. And another thing that I do want to point out to here is that the respondents really only selected most of the time either, you know, a kind of a possibility, you know, imagining a possible uh, way of answer or a possible way of being, or they were thinking about themselves, whereas most of the other options that we've, we've offered to respondents weren't really, weren't really um, selected. It's unclear in how far this speaks to comparability. I mean, in so far as this is sort of a multimodal or bimodal distribution, it seems like, okay, this is evidence against comparability. Because, you know, if, if you were to choose this kind of option as your endpoints, while another person might choose this kind of option as your endpoint, then it would be in some way kind of weird if all the other answers were um, comparable across individuals. So that speaks in some way against comparability. However, when we then correlate these kinds of um, uh, answers to, to um, with, with a respondent's own life satisfaction, then again, we, we get almost no correlation between a respondent's own life satisfaction and the kinds of endpoints that they select. And there's, there's different ways of, of you know, interpreting this kind of result. Uh, one interpretation that I favor is that when respondents initially answer a a life satisfaction question, they don't, in fact, explicitly um, think about endpoints and then make an answer on that basis. But I believe at least some people in the team disagree on that sort of interpretation. I will now skip the stuff on linearity because I think the stuff on neutrality is, is much more interesting and newer. And I also want to give time to, to, to Michael to talk about this. So maybe we will have some time. Um, in the Q and A, talking about neutrality. So, Michael, I'm sorry to to have been slower than I would want to have been. That was uh, wonderfully done, Casper. So, the um, the questions about neutrality are quite different in kind, um, and um, as Casper points, this is not something that that we're kind of used to to thinking about. So, um, you can kind of expect how, how this is going to go. So, I'll just kind of say what the what the issue is, uh, so the neutral point, that's when we're indifferent between existence and non-existence in terms of the value for someone. So when you are no better or no worse than, as good as dead. Um, and this is a decision we have to make somehow for purposes of trade-offs. Um, it's at least conceptually distinct from um, what, we had quite a lot of discussion about this in the team, what we ended up calling the zero point, so the, the level on your subjective well-being scale where you have none of that, so overall might satisfied or dissatisfied. Um, and, um, but I think intuitively, um, 
the kind of the theoretical case is that you would expect zero and neutral to, to be the same. <clears throat> so it is good for you to keep living if you're living a good life. It is bad for you to keep living if you're living a bad life. You know, where else is the, is the point supposed to be? Um, and, and, <clears throat> and on sort of a, a workhorse ethical theory like classical utilitarianism, the value of outcomes is just the sum total of well-being. So if you have negative well-being, that's bad. Um, <clears throat> but this will be relevant later. So thinking in terms of comparing quality and quality of life, this is not a new problem for, for well-being, but as we try and get into the, the well-be, it is one we, we have to, to grapple with uh, one way or another. Um, so in quality-adjusted life years, familiar measure, measure in health, you've got one, full health, zero, death, and um, qualities do allow states worse than death. Um, the, the scores are given by trade-off, so you know, a number of years in this condition, a number of years in this condition, you know, how would you, how would you, when would you be equal to, between them? Um, but it's pretty unclear if we, it's not obvious if we do want to use hypothetical preferences for well-being. Remember, the reason we're interested in well-being is because we care about how people's lives actually go, not about how choices they would make, often situations they know nothing about. So we're sort of, you know, the, the well-being tradition is sort of meaningfully different from the quality tradition, but again, that's going to be a bit of a problem. Um, people can get, it, it can be a bit difficult to talk about these sorts of issues, um, and I think the better way to think about it is that we're thinking about prioritising given limited resources rather than about okay, what, what we're saying to people, you're better off dead now. Uh, in the familiar healthcare question, there are limited resources, you have to make decisions. Somehow you want to, you want to strike the right balance. Okay, so a well-being life year, a, a one well-be would be a one point increase for one year on a zero to ten subjective well-being scale. Maybe it will be unfamiliar to some, but um, it's not, not that complicated. Uh, so if you go from 5 to 5.5 for two years, that would be one well-being. This is not supposed to be a trick. This is just really it's, it's simple maths. Um, but what about uh, extending a life? So if you extend a 6 out of 10 life for one year, how many well-bees is that? Is it 6 well-bees? Is it 1 well-bee? Is it somewhere in between? The answer you give to that question depends um, where you put the neutral point. So where is the point uh, that is equivalent to existence? Um, there's almost no discussion of this in the literature. Um, and there's no, uh, I think there's, yeah, basically no, no explicit discussion of how you should make this decision. There are some attempts to, to answer it, but there's not, there's no kind of theorizing, um, and there's no option here which seems um, uncontroversial. So why is that? So the sort of obvious choice, and the choice used by um, uh, Layard and co, um, uh, takes the, the neutral point to be zero out of ten. It seems well. Let's give the let's give the most generous value to, to saving a life. Um, but this means that a life can never be bad. You can never say that your life is good. So if you are having a life of constant torture, you would say a zero out of ten. And on this theory, it would still be that would, that that life would still count as that would have, have neutral value. Could not possibly have uh, negative value. So that seems not something that we really think is is true. Uh, if it's possible to have good lives, surely it's possible to have bad lives. Uh, you could take the neutral, uh, sorry, the, the central point of the scale, which implicitly is the zero point, um, to, uh, as your neutral point, but this implies sort of uncomfortably that a large fraction of the world's population are living lives that um, are at least bad for them right now. They might, might think their well-being increases over the course of their life, but right now they seem to be living bad lives. You might find that plausible, you might not find that plausible. Um, okay, how about somewhere between zero and five? Um, but you know, where exactly? And it seems like there's no principled way of doing this, so any choice in here seems ad hoc. So this is pretty unsatisfying. So of the, of the three obvious options, none of them look that good. So uh, you might think this is a good, a good place for subjective well-being research to kind of collect some data. We don't really know what we're talking about, but let's, you know, let's, let's throw, some, th throw some data at it. And there have been a few attempts to ask different sorts of to ask different sorts of questions in the area. There's quite a lot of ways you can frame this neutrality stuff, but they've all, they've all been pretty small sample sizes. And when you ask people these sorts of questions, um, they give you answers between um, this one is a slightly odd one. I'm not going to talk about it, but between sort of you know it's around two. Um, so if you ask, you know, at what point would you consider your life to be not worth living? People might give you you know answers around two. Um, but these are quite heterogeneous. Which question is really informative? What should be the, the sort of ground truth, gold standard question? Are we doing this in a sensible way? So what, what we do as a way of trying to, and uh, so as I as I commented, there's something um, 
sort of theoretically satisfying about the neutral point and the zero point lining up. So it's good for you to keep living when your life is good, converse. Um, and we thought, well, if people, if we know people are giving answers of round, of round two, maybe they think the neutral point and the zero point are at two, and maybe that's the explanation. So this is actually what we test. So we ask questions about zero point. Um, suppose you're just satisfied. Okay, so that a bit more straightforward. Where would you consider on the scale zero is, is not satisfied and dissatisfied? The neutral point is, at what level of satisfaction would your life cease being worth living for you, disregarding any effects your might life have on others? Um, so we're, we're splitting this and seeing what comes out. And this is what we find. So um, somewhat reassuringly, if you give people a, um, a related to comparability, if you give people a zero to 10 scale, they take the, the middle of the scale as the point where you, where you, have, where you, have, where you have overall zero of the scale, so that's satisfied, dissatisfied. That's a very sort of um, consistent response. But for the, for the neutral point, when we ask people, when would your life be not worth living, looking just at you, they um, say it's around zero or one. So people definitely think about these in the same way. And <laughs> this gives us a bit of a problem. <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, as the authors, we're not really sure uh, quite how to think about it. So yeah, as I mentioned, there's this sort of theoretical nice case for thinking that neutral and zero would be the same. It's definitely what utilitarianism implies. Um, Casper doesn't think this. Well, Casper, Casper has, has other objections, uh, which we'll get to just in a moment. And so, okay, we're, we're sort of out of theory here. What, what should we really do? And there's a question as to how should we take, how seriously should we take people's results for these sorts of things if we don't really understand what reasoning they're using? Uh, and remember, this was the kind of reason that we, as well-being people, like well-being, wanted to maybe be sceptical of hypothetical trade-offs. So here are some options. Um, it could be that people don't care about life satisfaction in answering these questions. So maybe they think, well, you know, I'm dissatisfied with my life, but I'm still happy. So it's good for me to keep living because I'm living a happy life and that's really what I care about. Um, it could be that there's something odd going on with, with a life worth living. So maybe if you ask people, is your life worth living? They feel like they, they really should give an answer, that they really should say yes. Um, so maybe you think your life is worth living. Even if your life is bad for you, maybe there's something kind of in people's interpretation that we're, we're asking a bad question about. Or maybe people aren't answering quote unquote correctly, so they're still accounting for effects on others. They're, they're accounting, there's some facts of social desirability. They think you should say lives are worth living, even if they, you know, you, you think those lives are bad. Um, so, <laughs> what do we do? We're a bit stuck, unlike in the other two areas where, you know, we, we feel like we're basically reasonably confident as to what's going on. So, this is, so we'd like to ask some further questions. We recognise asking people these questions is, is, is difficult. We don't want to overload them. Uh, so here's some things we could, we, we could do. We could ask people the equivalent questions around happiness rather than life satisfaction. Maybe that gives us different results. Maybe zero and neutral align um, for one reason or another. We could ask some comprehension question checks. People, maybe you know, some people aren't really understanding this question. Um, we could ask that we could frame the questions in a different way, so not about worth living, maybe about non-existence. Um, another thing to do would be to ask directly about trade-offs. So, um, okay, so let's say you could live one year at eight out of ten, or n years at six out of ten. What trade-off would you make? Let's say you thought that neutrality was five. Then am I going to embarrass myself? Then you get then n would be three. Okay, so that's kind of a way of of where, where are people taking the neutral point to be in these sorts of questions. Um, or we can ask some other questions. What would those be? And there's this sort of slightly different issue from what's the theoretically right thing to do versus if this is an awkward issue to get people to, to talk about, does there need to be some sort of different way for policy engagement? So maybe you, know, you need to survey people even if you think that the survey questions aren't, aren't really that informative, something like that. Um, okay, so that's, that's uh, my part. So here are the issues. Um, you got two out of three discussed, so consider, <coughs> consider yourselves lucky. Um, Casper talked about comparability, I talked about neutrality. Uh, we're keen to hear your, your feedback and ideas. Thanks.